tonight on CBC Vancouver News. This safety notice restricts commercial passenger flights from any operator of the Boeing 737 MAX 8 or MAX 9 variant aircraft, whether domestic or foreign, from arriving, departing or overflying Canadian airspace. Canada and the United States ground the aircraft involved in two deadly crashes. The plane that we were going to be boarding was a MAX 8, so they had to ground it. Thousands of passengers scramble to find other flights. Uh, it does not make sense to me. How a local businessman is alleged to have hired someone to help get his sons into elite U.S. colleges. This is CBC Vancouver News. Boeing 737 MAX jets parked at the tarmac at Vancouver International Airport. The planes grounded by the Canadian government. And inside the terminal here at YVR this morning, hundreds of travelers told their flights had been canceled. Good evening, I'm Mike Killeen, live at Vancouver International Airport. And I'm Anita Bath in our CBC Vancouver studios. After refusing to join other countries in grounding all Boeing 737 MAX 8 airplanes, new data has prompted the Canadian government to change its position. Now, we are going to get to that in a minute, but first, Mike, this has obviously had a huge impact on travellers. Indeed, Anita, uh, people showing up at the airport here this morning were told they weren't going to be able to go where they were expecting to. With their MAX flights canceled, passengers at YVR were scrambling to make other travel plans. I haven't been on a flight that's been canceled before, so it's a new experience as a bright side, but I'm just trying to figure out I need to be at work tomorrow. I don't want to take any more vacation days. I think they're, it's wise for them to take the prudent course. You know, I, I like the fact they're choosing safety over you know, economy, so, and we've got plenty of time. We actually booked our flight well in advance. We're not in a rush. Air Canada says nine to 12,000 people travel every day on the airline's 24 Boeing 737 MAX 8s. North Vancouver's Patrick Kinney was supposed to fly home tomorrow from Maui. You can try phoning Air Canada. There's no response. There's a message saying that uh, they're not taking any calls, that calls will be delayed, not returned. Uh, we've gone online. We don't know what to do. This afternoon, Air Canada asking passengers to be patient, saying it's moving wide-body aircraft onto Hawaii routes where the MAX was flying. Yes, it's unfortunate, but we must put safety uh, at the top of the agenda. It has to be paramount in our, in our considerations. The transport minister acknowledging the impact on passengers. I think they just had to gather all the facts, but um, I think it's a smart decision, absolutely. And for those arriving in Vancouver on max flights just before the grounding order. I'm just glad I landed, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, we're here and we're safe. So I was a little bit nervous, uh, but the flight was fine. The landing was okay, but I would have preferred not having been on it, to be honest. And like Air Canada, WestJet is also trying to rebook its passengers tonight. Uh, WestJet has 13 MAX 8s in its fleet. It's going to waive those rebooking fees, but needless to say, Anita, this has had a huge impact on the traveling public. And Mike, it is important to note all of this is happening after two plane crashes involving MAX 8s, the most recent in Ethiopia, killing 157 people, 18 Canadians, and another in October off Indonesia. Now, Canada and the U.S. were two of the last holdouts of countries temporarily banning the planes until today. A Boeing 737 MAX 8 arriving at YVR this afternoon with no passengers on board. One of many repositioning flights after the grounding of all MAX 8s and 9s. The airplanes slowly disappearing off flight trackers throughout the day. I am issuing a safety notice. Canada's transportation minister making the decision as a result of new satellite data, comparing the Ethiopian Airlines crash to another Boeing MAX 8 crash in Indonesia in October. Not conclusive, but there are similarities that sort of uh, exceed a certain threshold in our minds with respect to the possible uh, cause of, uh, of uh, what happened uh, in Ethiopia. A change of position for Ottawa after maintaining it didn't have enough evidence to ground the planes, but today, hours after Canada's announcement, the U.S. following suit. We were coordinating with Canada. We were giving them information. They were giving us information. 
uh, we very much work in conjunction with Canada. Soon after the U.S. grounding order, Boeing itself grounding the planes worldwide. The Seattle-based company is facing some tough days ahead. They want this solved. They want it solved quickly. They don't know the problem yet. They have to find the problem. No one has any idea how long that will take. For now, these planes will remain parked on tarmacs and in hangars everywhere. Okay, you just heard Canada's transportation minister saying the decision to ground the planes is as a result of new satellite data. And Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with more on that part of the story, Joe. Yeah, Mike, up until now, Mike and Anita, the information that other agencies have been making their decisions on all have to do with radar, so ground-based stations. The announcement this morning that we had new satellite information is basically the new, newest uh, or in the only uh, new piece of technical data we've received since Sunday night. Uh, so take a listen to an official from Transport Canada uh, break that information down. What we received overnight was reliable and verified information uh, that demonstrated uh, the flight profile of the two aircraft, their altitudes, their speeds, and how they changed altitudes over time. Based on that data, comparing the two incidents, our flight safety engineers looked at it and they felt that there was a troubling parallel between the two incidents. That was the data that they needed to recommend to us that it was time to uh, restrict the flights of these aircraft in Canada. So this really was new information that the rest of the world uh, didn't have as of this morning. Uh, I reached out to Arion. Uh, this is a company of which Nav Canada is a major client of. Uh, they have been deploying the world's first global and 100% uh, space-based aircraft tracking and surveillance system. They've been sending up their system over the past year uh, with Iridium satellites. They are still in the beta testing phase, but they confirmed to me that they indeed did, indeed did give that information uh, to Transport Canada. Take a look at their statement uh, that they uh, issued to me. The Arion space-based ADSB system has the ability to monitor the data from all aircraft equipped with these transponders, and the system was able to capture information associated with Flight 302. At the request of the FAA, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, Transport Canada, and several other authorities, Arion provided the data transmitted from Flight 302 to support the accident investigation. So the authorities are now in receipt of this data. We cannot comment on the cause of the tragedy or the outcome of the investigation, only that we have provided this data. This unfortunate tragedy further highlights the need for a global, real-time air traffic surveillance system. And really, uh, Arion and uh, Nav Canada Canada came into partnership after MH370 when we really realized that we have this lack of global continuous uh, data monitoring. Uh, so again, confirming that uh, Canada was able to get this satellite information this morning. Okay, and Joe, what has Transport Canada learned about the two crashes from this new data? So we don't know exactly what this new uh, satellite data shows, but what it likely does is enhance those two radar profiles showing more similarities between Sunday's crash and the crash back in October. So I want to show you what one of these radar profile looks like, starting with, uh, this is the Iridium uh, data software, but I want to take you to the profile. It's a, a very technical looking graph. This is from Lion Air back in October. And then compare it to uh, the Indonesian Airlines radar profile from Sunday. So not as detailed, not as uh, long. Partly that's because uh, there's a lot of mountains in the area, so we didn't have as much coverage with that ground-based radar system. So likely what happened uh, with the satellite data, it was able to fill in more points and show more similarities between those two profiles. Again, nothing conclusive, as we heard from Garneau this morning, but more similarities than what we had before this morning. And I should also mention the next piece of information we really need is that flight data recorder. And it has yet to be analyzed, hearing that it was first sent to Germany. They didn't have the technical capabilities to analyze it. It is now being sent to France. That is going to be able to really line up those two profiles and tell us if indeed uh, the similarities are exact. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. All right, Joe, and we're going to have uh, much more on this uh, story tonight, uh, including the CBC's Susan Ormiston on the ground in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the scene of the crash, and the CBC's Briar Stewart reporting from the Boeing factory in Seattle. Now, I mentioned that the airlines here are, of course, uh, scrambling to rebook passengers on flights. Air Canada is introducing uh, wide-body aircraft on the Hawaii routes. In fact, 
They do have an aircraft, uh, a Dreamliner, leaving in about 20 minutes from now to try to get some of those people not only to Hawaii, but back home again tonight. Anita? Thanks very much, Mike. Well, secrecy, fake IDs, and tons of money. That's how U.S. prosecutors allege local Vancouver businessman David Sidhu got someone to write the SAT exam for his two sons, who ultimately got accepted into prestigious universities in California. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen has more. Bibi Malek often gets approached by starry-eyed parents with hopes of getting their kids into Ivy League universities. Dreams about uh, getting into schools like MIT and Harvard. Her job is to coach students at an early age to get into college south of the border. But she's honest, getting into those schools is like winning the lottery. Chances are small given the acceptance rates that are in the 4 to 5 percent range. And we're now learning how some parents allegedly try to cheat the system by bribing their children's way into those schools. Fake test scores, fake athletic credentials, fake photographs, bribed college officials. 50 people have been charged, including David Sidhu, a notable businessman, former CFL player, and a prominent donor to UBC. Sir, is there anything you want to say to the charges? He allegedly paid William Rick Singer, the admissions consultant at the heart of this case, $200,000. Singer, who has pled guilty to all charges, then hired Mark Riddell, a college admissions exam expert at a Florida high school. Court documents allege Riddell traveled from Tampa, Florida, to write SATs for Sidhu's two sons, and even traveled in 2012 to take a Canadian high school graduation exam. Both of Sidhu's sons attended St. George's. But the all-boys private school says it conducted an internal investigation and found that no school or provincial exams were written at St. George's School by the student in question. Sidhu's sons were later accepted to University of California, Berkeley and Chapman University. The older son transferred out of Chapman in 2014. UC Berkeley wouldn't say what happened to the other son. Today, Sidhu's lawyer said his client's children have not been accused of any impropriety and have achieved great accomplishments in their own right. There are plenty of companies in Vancouver that claim to help students get into top schools, but Malek believes they are more ethical. It's generally U.S. providers who have been involved in these kinds of scams. Sidhu is to appear in court in Massachusetts on Friday and is expected to plead not guilty. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. HIV and AIDS charities in B.C. say they're struggling to get support, blaming it on possible perception that the diseases have been cured and are no longer a problem. Lian Young has more. Okay, so this person here um, does not want any pork. Stuffing bags of frozen meals, artist Joe Average is making personalized care packages for people with HIV and AIDS. He used to survive on these when he was much sicker. They helped me out for almost three years, you know. Fed me and kept me, kept me going. Helping to keep others going is now an honor for him. These bags are being packaged up and eventually about 350 of them will go out to people around the Lower Mainland. And about the three decades that this organization has been around, that number has stayed steady. But recent news like this. A new report from a prestigious medical journal that documents a person being cured of HIV. Could be sending the wrong message about the ongoing need for help. So news like this can be a little bit misleading, so we want people to understand uh, that our services are still needed in the community and we quite haven't reached a cure yet. This organization has been receiving calls from the public asking if donations are still needed, with some thinking the virus has been cured, and that's a big concern. Other HIV charities are also having challenges. I think we've seen a decline each and every year in funding, through donations, through government grants. That may be in part due to BC's success with managing the epidemic. I asked my GP what my life expectancy would be. And I seem to recall the numbers 9 to 14 months. 
That was in the 90s. Today, people are living much longer in B.C., and the infection rate is at an all-time low. The, the light at the end of the tunnel is getting brighter and brighter. British Columbia today is proportionally saving money as a result of the good investments that we have done in HIV AIDS control. Contracting the investment today would be extremely dangerous. He worries if people stop seeing HIV as a serious and ongoing problem, it could lead to a rebound. That's something Joe Average doesn't want. He's hopeful there will be a future without HIV and AIDS. But until then, he's focused on helping people struggling today. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver's annual homeless count wrapped up today with volunteers and support workers out in full force. Last year's count found a record number of homeless people in the city, more than 2,100 people without reliable shelter. Vancouver hopes temporary modular housing will mean a reduction in that number this year, but says it is still pushing for more permanent solutions. Over the long term, we need permanent structures. And so what we're looking at, for example, SROs in the downtown east side, uh, we are working, for example, to expropriate a number of those that are in such disrepair and then moving ahead with permanent housing as well. Culturally appropriate housing is also a consideration as Indigenous populations make up about 40% of Vancouver's homelessness, despite only accounting for 2% of the city's total population. All right, we have some breaking news for you now. An arrest has been made in relation to a number of indecent acts near a girls' private school in Vancouver. And the person arrested is a police officer. CBC News at 11 host Dan Burrett is with us now. Dan, what more do we know? Anita, Vancouver police say they arrested someone early yesterday morning related to a series of indecent acts near York House School. That's off King Ed and Granville. The RCMP now says the suspect arrested is a Mountie. Criminal charges have not been laid yet, so the suspect's name is not being released. Vancouver police tell us the suspect has been released with conditions. The RCMP says it, was, it is aware the VPD identified a suspect and now confirms it is a Mountie. It notes the allegations relate to incidents that occurred while the officer was off duty. The Mountie has been suspended with pay and the force has begun an internal code of conduct. Again, the officer's name is not being released right now as they have not been charged with a crime, at least for now. Anita? All right, thank you. Dan Burrett live in studio tonight. Okay, it was a beautiful day out there again today, so let's bring in Johanna Wagstaff, and uh, I think it's only going to get better, isn't it? I think you're on to something, Anita. Yes, the trend of warming temperatures and clearing skies will continue there is a bit of a caveat though, after tomorrow, we do have to get through a few showers and a slight drop in temperatures for our Thursday, and then we can continue on this spring-like climb. Uh, looking at the current temperatures right now, nine at YVR, so we're not doing too badly today. Double digits out towards Pitt Meadows, uh, hanging on to an eight down towards Victoria. So temperatures are at least at seasonal today across the South Coast. They are going to be climbing, though. So let's just get right to the good news before I take you through those showers tomorrow. Here's that temperature profile through the weekend and into early next week. And you can see we do hit the mid-teens. Uh, this is all uh, model-generated data, so I'll show you my honed numbers later on. I think you'll be even more pleased. Uh, there is a slight drop, though, again, as we head into Thursday, and that is because of this weather maker, this low pressure system sitting in the Alaska Gulf, uh, bringing rain and snow to central and northern coastal sections tonight as it moves into the south coast. And that's the cloud we're seeing out there right now, increasing cloud through the overnight. Uh, it does lose its punch. So by the time it gets to us for tomorrow, not a lot of rain left in the forecast. I do have overcast skies and showers to start your Thursday, but it's not a washout of a day. And we will get back to those uh, double digits in the forecast before long. So we'll take you through a very spring-like outlook coming up. Okay, thanks, Joe. See you in a bit. Sounds good. This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. And just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. If you are watching right now on Facebook or YouTube, we are also live during the commercial break, so don't go anywhere.
You may see Surrey's Newton neighborhood in the news for all the wrong reasons, but there are some real treasures. The CBC's Jesse Johnston will explain coming up. Okay, for this week's edition of Wagstaff Wednesday, I know this is everybody's favorite day, we're taking you to the South Pole. Cracks in an ice shelf have forced researchers to shut down an Antarctic station. Now, British scientists have made the decision for the third straight year, and Johanna explains why the station is so significant. A British Antarctic research station is being shut down for a third winter in a row after a large new crack was discovered in the shelf that it sits on. The Haley 6 station, which is parked on the Brunt ice shelf, will be shut down between March and November 2018 through 2019, with the 14 staff members who had been gearing up for the winter redeployed elsewhere or brought home to the UK. They will leave behind about 80% of the experiments they'd normally conduct through the polar night operating on automatic. The director of the British Antarctic Survey says the decision is a precautionary one. Sending in planes to evacuate personnel in winter darkness and in bad weather is an unnecessary risk. The worries are based on two cracks. The first is an ice chasm that began its slow movement northward in 2012 after more than 30 years of dormancy, and it has now accelerated over the past seven months. The second, north of the research station, has been dubbed the Halloween crack after it appeared in October a couple of years ago. It's now estimated to be about 50 kilometers in length and growing eastward. In fact, advancing a couple of kilometers just in the past few months, actually crossing a resupply route to the station. Haley is enormously important to Antarctic scientific activities. The original station was set up by British researchers in 1956, and the station is still used to gather data on a range of observations, mainly encompassing climate change, but famously, it played a critical role in the research that identified the ozone hole in 1985, and in recent years has become a major player in studying its solar activity. Scientists say that the current situation is probably part of the normal calving process that occurs at the edge of ice shelves, but the more research is needed to know if climate change is speeding up this event. What they do know is that eventually a section of the ice will break off and float away as an iceberg, one about the size of greater London, England. Currently, though, scientists believe the station is in a good spot on the shelf to remain intact after that Calvin event happens. And one way or another, people will go back to the base when sunlight starts to return in the polar south around October, November, and scientific activities will resume then. And now, you're Science Smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. And like, like Johanna just mentioned, you can send your questions to her at any time by following and messaging her on Twitter at jwagstaff. And stick around with us. We will be back with more news in just a few moments. Mike will stay at YVR and we'll go back to him for an update as well. In 1974, Surrey's Newton neighborhood was home to farmland and not much else. But a chef from Spain looked at the sleepy community and decided it needed a little jazzing up, as you'll find out in the latest installment of Jesse Johnston's series, Surrey, Why We Live Here. It worked out pretty well. Back when Surrey was just a bedroom community and Newton was mostly farmland, a chef and his wife looked at this old house and had a crazy idea. Well, my father loves to tell this story of like, uh, he's like, I'm gonna open up a French fine dining restaurant in Newton in, uh, in 1974, when there were still dirt, dirt roads, gravel roads in the community. Looking over to New Westminster. The Aguirre family opened the old Surrey restaurant 45 years ago. Philip Aguirre started working for his parents in the kitchen when he was nine years old and needed to stand on a stool to do the dishes. I got my start in the dish pit. Uh, I've, I've done busboying, I've, I've done, been the prep cook, I've been the cook. Aguirre now runs the business. It's the same location, but the neighborhood around it has changed a great deal. Newton's population is now bigger than Coquitlam's, and nearly 60% of the people who live here are South Asian. As Newton has grown, so too has the Guru Nanak Sikh Gurdwara. 
Volunteers work round the clock here, serving free meals to anyone who wants one. The Good Rest Lab is run on a volunteer purposes, so our role is always try to um, provide the services or provide the resources or ask um, or kind of direct the community to the resources that are out there. Spirituality is always first and foremost here, but the temple's role is expanding. It's still a place to pray, but you can now come here for everything from help with your taxes to advice on keeping your kids away from gangs and drugs. Yeah, I would call it the Gudr Sahib as a hub. I call it as a spiritual place, um, or we call it as a spiritual place where to get together. But it is the center, it is the heart of the community. It's a community where, just like back in the day, young people take care of the dishes. And even though its population has grown to nearly 150,000 people, it's still welcoming newcomers. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Doctors in Halifax say some patients are choosing to die because they can't afford the living costs associated with a lung transplant. As the CBC's Carolyn Ray tells us, the operation is not available in Nova Scotia, so most patients are sent to Toronto. At 42 years old, Natalie Jarvis told her doctor she was ready to die. I've been sick for so long that I forgot how it felt to feel good. Jarvis has a rare autoimmune condition and her only chance of survival is a double lung transplant. That's why she's here living in downtown Toronto, waiting for her match. But this trip to Ontario almost didn't happen. Jarvis lives in rural Nova Scotia, about an hour outside of Halifax. At the end of last year, her health deteriorated rapidly. She was told she needed to come up with at least $10,000 to pay for accommodations and food. Her mom would also have to leave her job at a grocery store to look after her. Jarvis thought she was a burden. It was a really rough decision. So on January 3rd, I did mention palliative care to the doctors. And I was ready to just call it quits and give up. I mean, to think a 40-year-old may choose death as opposed to um, asking people for money, it's really hard to go home at the end of the day and feel good about that. In Halifax, Dr. Meredith Chieson was on the receiving end of that conversation. She works with a small team and they oversee most of the lung transplant patients in the Maritimes. Transplant patients have lost their homes, even their life savings while waiting for a match. This year, two patients decided to move into palliative care because of money. But emotionally, as I said, they're at their worst time in their life, when they're desperately sick and facing death, we're asking them to leave their friends, their family, their support system, um, and, and to move halfway across the country. While each Atlantic province chips in some money to help with their expenses, it's nowhere near enough to cover housing as Toronto prices soar. On average, patients wait six months for a match and have to stay three months after surgery while they recover. For Natalie Jarvis, it was her doctor who changed her mind, convincing her patient she could do it. You know, if I don't give up the fight, then I can get through this. Um, which is what I'm planning to do. Jarvis's employer, friends and family chipped in to help get her started, taking away some of the stress of money for now while she fights for her life. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Toronto. And an update to this report. After CBC News aired the story, Nova Scotia's health minister ordered a review of the money given to lung transplant patients each month. The minister wants to determine if the program is not adequate enough for Nova Scotians. The fast-selling aircraft in its fleet, now Boeing's 737, MAX 8s and 9s have all been grounded. So what is this doing to the aviation giant? Coming up, we head out to Seattle to find out.
Let's take you back now to today's top story. Relatives of those killed in the Ethiopian Airlines disaster arrived at the crash scene today. 157 people were killed when that aircraft went down on Sunday. The CBC's Susan Ormiston now on the family's search for answers. Addis Ababa has now become a hub for more and more families coming from across the world to see where that plane went down. They're making a kind of pilgrimage, a few each day out to the site. And now the site is moving away from the investigation phase and more into a kind of memorial. Today, it was a Chinese group, clearly overwrought at the scene before them. They erected a memorial of wreaths and roses and clearly taking home this memory of this is where their family members last ended up. A senior government official says five groups of Canadians are in the Ethiopian capital. That includes family members of the 18 Canadians who died, plus other Canadians who are mourning nationals from other countries. This is clearly a multinational catastrophe. Councillor officials are trying to prepare families that what they most want to come away with something from their family may not happen. The identification stage, we're told, is at a very early phase. It's very complicated. The sheer force of that crash dove that plane into the ground with catastrophic results for the aircraft and for those on board. So they've come to see the scene, but they also want to take something back, perhaps to bury, and that may not happen, certainly not within days and perhaps even weeks. So as we move the investigation off-site into the forensic labs, the scene has been reclaimed in, in a ways for people coming to honour their loved ones. Susan Ormiston, CBC News in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. As we've told you, Boeing 737 MAX 8s are grounded worldwide after the Ethiopian crash and another involving the same plane in October. That is taking its toll on the company's employees who now find their work under international scrutiny. The CBC's Briar Stewart visited one of Boeing's factories in Washington State. It's the afternoon shift change at the Boeing factory. 12,000 people work here, the home of the 737 MAX jet. An employee told CBC that the groundings are the talk on the factory floor and in the community too. If Boeing wasn't here, our business wouldn't be here. And so, yeah, it's, it's nerve wracking a little bit to know what might come of all this. Greg Heller's parents run a business that has contracts with Boeing, but there's another reason he's paying close attention. As a flight attendant, I'm glad I'm not flying that particular aircraft for my company. But this plane drives all of the work here. Crews assemble them, putting the final touches on jets destined for airlines around the world, including Canada. Of the 5,800 orders Boeing currently has for planes, 80% of them are for the 737 MAX. It's the fastest selling aircraft in Boeing's history, which is why there's a lot at stake for the company. What do you think it's like in that factory and in the offices right now? Devastating. You know, I think everybody's questioning, what did they miss? What could they have done better? Um, it's a tragic outcome to see your product take lives. Peter Lemmy worked as a Boeing engineer and manager. He still believes the 737 MAX is safe, but says it's disappointing the company didn't update its software earlier. We knew what had happened to Lion Air. We knew that MCAS had some design deficiencies. Um, Boeing did not take that information and go out in the fleet and fix all those airplanes with a sense of urgency. This journalist covers the aviation industry and says the groundings are going to be painful for the company. And you declare an airplane to be the fastest, best selling in the world when it has some problems, you're going to get a lot more scrutiny. Still, he believes the long term outlook is good, considering that Boeing makes around 50 planes a month here, which means it will take the company seven years to fulfill all the orders it currently has. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Brenton, Washington. An Ontario man says he's lucky to be alive after a small plane almost crashed into his car. Dashcam footage making the rounds online 
shows the plane cutting across Markham's 16th Avenue before crashing into an embankment near a busy multi-lane highway. The driver tells our Farrah Malani he braked just in time. It literally just passed me and I had like a second to brake and swerve. Yesterday was supposed to be Bill Chan's day off. Instead, he almost got hit by a plane while driving his truck. And so it was right after you made that right turn when you saw this plane. I was just driving, I got off the highway, and then I was picking up speed, and then the plane just came right in front of me. I tried to dodge it, and then that's when everything crashed. How close was this plane to you? It was like two car lengths when it flew by. And if you hadn't put your foot on the brake, what would have happened? Front end would have been gone. I would have been hurt. How lucky do you feel right now? Very lucky. I went home, I hugged my son, and that was it. The plane was a single engine four seater with two people on board, a flight instructor and their student. Neither was seriously injured. This is when the plane shot out. Just whizzes past you. Yes. Chen, who's a tow truck driver, says he didn't realize just how close the plane was until he went home and looked at his dash cam video. We drive at a living, so we're prepared for stuff like that, but not a plane. Because of where this crash happened along such a busy highway, the plane had to be quickly removed and brought back here to the Buttonville Airport, where it remains today behind these gates. The plane will be part of the ongoing investigation by the Transportation Safety Board. They'd taken off, it had come around, it had done a landing and then kept rolling, which was called a touch and go, and into the takeoff portion. And it's in that takeoff portion where things went wrong. The TSB says at the time of the crash, the plane was being operated by the flight instructor, but says they still don't know what happened. That's the hard part is to, to try to determine why, why it didn't work. I mean, obviously they had the intention to, 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 to have it work and to have the takeoff go as normal. <laughs> as for Chen, he considers himself lucky and is now trying to cash in on that luck. Our company, we pitched in and then we bought like 300 bucks. <laughs> worth the lottery ticket. Well, worth the lottery tickets. Hopefully we get a couple of free tickets. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. At 6.39 on this Wednesday evening, you're looking at a live shot of BC Place from our studios tonight. Still light out. A cold, crisp day in Metro Vancouver, but rain and warmth is on its way back. Johanna's here next with the details.
This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Okay, I think everybody is counting down the days until we get those higher temperatures. I think so too. <laughs> You've all seen them by now. Yeah. The rumors are true. Spring is around the corner. We just have to get through that blip tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Let me take you through the time lapse though. A cloudy start to our Wednesday out there. Uh, lingering moisture from that cold front that swept through yesterday morning. Uh, temperatures were pretty mild this morning. We uh, basically stayed above zero by a few degrees, finally hitting seasonals across the south coast today, as I uh, mentioned earlier. And we did get some sunny breaks out there. You can see the shadows across the city, even if we didn't see them on the uh, North Shore. So uh, big picture across the country as far as temperatures go tonight, uh, nine in through Vancouver, four up towards Kelowna. Uh, temperature is still cold in through the north, but it's nice that the rest of the country is sharing in that Arctic lift. Uh, two and through Toronto and a minus four and through St. John's. Should mention, I am tracking a major blizzard hitting the U.S. Midwest right now. Blizzard and winter storm warnings in place from North Dakota all the way down to New Mexico. So lots of flight delays and cancellations. If you were thinking of starting a March break early, you might want to check what's happening south of the border and uh, southern Ontario is going to be getting into that rain for tomorrow. Uh, we just have showers. I wouldn't call it a full rain day for us. As I mentioned earlier, this is the uh, top end of a front that is sliding down into our neck of the woods for tomorrow. Increasing cloud overnight. I'm going to pause you at 7 a.m. That's when there's a hint of the showers. Uh, higher elevations uh, back up towards 1,000 meters, 900 meters maybe. We'll see some wet snow mixing, but for most of the south coast. This is a rain story for tomorrow with our temperatures well above the freezing mark. Uh, by Thursday evening, still looking at the risk for a few lingering showers, but again, they're really scattered and we might even see some blue sky breaks between those rounds. And as I run this right through Friday, note it's not an all blue sky day. The model's still picking up some lingering high cloud. Uh, high pressure is in place uh, building for tomorrow, but it's not a strong high pressure. So we do have uh, lingering clouds for the next couple of days. Four overnight tonight, back up to a nine, so just a touch cooler than where we were at today. This might be a, a bit generous, eights and nines across Metro Vancouver, hoping for some sunny breaks out there. But again, it is, this is our blip in the uh, forecast. I don't see any other major rainmaker after this. There's the top end of that front, uh, also bringing some snow, light snow to the interior. We're seeing that tonight across central coastal sections. And then here's that little high pressure that builds in nicely behind it, uh, settling down for Friday and Saturday. But again, note the clouds across the rest of the province. It's not a true blue sky forecast until Sunday. So let me take you there with the long range. An eight, nine tomorrow, back up to the double digits for Friday. Again, mainly cloudy skies, but definitely dry for Friday and Saturday at this point. Uh, it's the Sunday forecast that we really get the jump in those temperatures. Seasonals are around nine or 10. So by the time we hit Monday and Tuesday, we are five to six degrees above seasonal. All blue skies. Wow. I don't know who's going to show up to work. Uh, everybody's going to be at the beach, obviously. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we deserve this. <laughs> yes, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. And an unusual protest was ruffling feathers outside the City Hall of Sydney, Nova Scotia today. A few people and their roosters rallying against a proposed ban on pets. The city was voting on banning the birds over noise and odor complaints. But in the end, the roosters won their fight. Gary Mansfield has the details. Cornflake and Jefferson were the cock of the walk at City Hall last night as the roosters and their owners took to the streets over the proposed ban. Rethink what this council is going to vote on or move forward because where is it going to stop? Is it going to be horses next? Inside, people came to have their say on the bylaw as a handful of supporters came to the bird's rescue. My roosters are not as loud as any Harleys, any fireworks by the municipality. The smells are not as bad as the municipality's dump. But not everyone wanted roosters crowing in their urban area. I like to sleep in on Saturday morning. I'm 71. I work full time. I want one day to sleep in. And I don't need a performance outside our bedroom window. Even some councillors supported the band, but only in urban areas. 
If I'm going to move to the city of Sydney and spend $250,000, $300,000 on a home in a subdivision in the middle of the city, I have a level of expectation that I'm not going to be next door to a rooster. Before the night was over, councillors voted against the rooster ban, but owners will now be held responsible for their behaviour and could face fines if there's an odour or a noise complaint. How are the members of the Cape Breton Regional Police Force trained in dealing with such noise and odour complaints generated by animals? Outside, Cornflake and Jefferson celebrated the win, the only way they know how. <coughs> Gary Mansfield, CBC News, Sydney. The roosters won. It's a tough one, though. I, I mean, imagine if you live next to one of these yeah, roosters. Yeah, I always want to be team animals, but then hearing the other side, it's I'm a little like, bit tough. Yeah, I know. Well, it's a good thing it's not it's happening not waking here. waking you up tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. An emergency meeting into the SNC Lavalin affair was shut down today. The opposition wanted Jody Wilson rabled back to testify, but the Liberals defeating the motion. We'll have the latest from Ottawa next. opposition attempt to get further testimony from Jody Wilson-Raybould fell short today. Minutes after the emergency meeting began, Liberal members passed a motion to postpone the discussion. The CBC's David Cochran has more. The opposition pushed for this emergency meeting to press for more testimony from Jody Wilson-Raybould. We've heard the first part of the truth, but the rest of the truth remains a secret. Canadians want the other half of the story from her. This meeting was scheduled for two hours. But rather than sit there and take it from the opposition, the Liberals tabled a motion to adjourn. So in that spirit, I propose that the committee do now adjourn. A procedural torpedo to shut down the meeting. Over opposition objections, it went to an immediate vote. Madame Lapointe? Mr. McKinnon? What a shame. What a shame. Mr. Mr. Barrett, Barrett. cover up. No, it's a cover up. I'm voting against Mr. Cooper. Cover -up. I'm voting against this cover up. Uh, Mr. Poliver. Against the cover up. And Ms. Ramsey. 
I'm strongly voting opposed, and I'm shocked at the behavior it's of my despicable. colleagues. It's disgusting. So, so that being you said, should be ashamed of your. That being said, the motion is adopted. The meeting is adjourned. So, just 26 minutes in, the meeting was over. The Liberal majority shut it down and fueled opposition outrage. And I have never seen been so disgusted by the conduct of my Liberal colleagues. What does this say to Canadians? That they have something to hide. If they didn't have something to hide, we would have had the debate, we would have had the conversation today. <laughs> the Liberal move doesn't end this debate, it simply pushes it to another meeting previously scheduled for next week. The committee has already expressed its wishes on March 6th to have this particular hearing on uh, March 19th, so it's as simple as that. We will uh, revisit this issue on Tuesday. But Tuesday will likely happen behind closed doors. No cameras, no transcripts, and it will all happen on the same day as the federal budget. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, another wild political day in the United Kingdom with the clock ticking down on Brexit. Another vote today, Parliament voting narrowly to not leave the EU without a deal. Thomas Degla has more from London. Who's to say what's next for Britain when the headlines are this harsh and the outlook is just as brutal. The whole world is watching this Brexit show, every misstep and tussle. And Theresa May's former spokesman partly blames his old boss. When it came to the crunch, they weren't ready for it, they weren't ready to give ground and come to an accommodation, and that's why we've got so stuck. We're just making a spectacle of ourselves. It's embarrassing. Parliament is stuck with MPs saying again and again what they don't want, but never what they would support. And this vote doesn't help. Order. Questions Parliament to focused Prime today Minister. on whether Britain should leave the EU without a divorce deal. But this House has to decide. It has to decide what it wants. The Prime Minister still trying to appear in control. Uh, Mr. Speaker. With I'm hardly a leg to stand on, and barely a voice to speak with. I may not have my own voice, but I do understand the voice of the country. And that is, people want to leave the EU. And most MPs want to avoid crashing out with no deal, sending a clear message to the government with their votes. The ice to the right, 321. The no to the left, 278. Yeah! The result doesn't force the government to reach a new deal, but it is another stinging rebuke to the Prime Minister. The deal on the table is indeed the only deal available. And it further muddles an already complicated breakup. Whatever happens, deal or no deal, we need to respect the result of the referendum and lead the European Union. That exit date, known for two years, is now in question, with MPs voting tomorrow on requesting a Brexit delay. So much for planning ahead. Thomas Dagg to CBC News, London. Donald Trump's one-time campaign manager is facing even more prison time. A judge in Washington, D.C., sentencing Paul Manafort to an additional three and a half years on federal conspiracy charges. He was already handed nearly four years last week for fraud. Manafort will now serve a total of seven and a half years between the two cases. And the federal government has introduced more measures to end abuse of amateur athletes by their coaches. Sport is my life. My coaches were the best parts of my childhood. And sport was a safe place. It was my refuge. And I wish this were the case for all athletes. The move comes a month after CBC News revealed at least 222 coaches have been convicted of sexual offences over 20 years. Minister of Science and Sport Kirsty Duncan introducing a new independent investigation unit. It will look into complaints of harassment, abuse and discrimination in amateur sports. The minister also announcing a national toll-free confidential helpline for victims and witnesses of abuse in sport. Well, Canada leading the way today, banning Boeing MAX 8 and 9 planes from our airspace. Hours later, the U.S. following suit. So with Boeing grounding all planes worldwide, we'll talk about what happens now after the break.
Thursday on the Early Edition, we continue our series, Surrey, Why We Live Here, and we'll head to Clayton Heights with reporter Jesse Johnston. You know, a community was designed for young families when the most popular coffee shop in town revolves around play dates. That's tomorrow on the Early Edition. Well, Canada today reversing its decision, now grounding all Boeing 737 MAX 8s and 9s. And this comes after that deadly Ethiopian Airlines crash earlier this week and another crash involving, involving the same type of plane off Indonesia back in October. This, of course, has had a big impact on travelers today at YVR. That's where Mike is. Mike, what can people expect in the days to come? Well, I think they can expect to be spending a lot of time on the phone or online with their airlines uh, trying to rebook. Uh, patience certainly is going to be uh, in order. However, the airlines are trying to move other aircraft onto routes that was served by the MAX 8. Uh, Hawaii, for example, a Dreamliner, a bigger aircraft, just left Vancouver about four minutes ago to go to Maui to take people there and bring the ones uh, back that were supposed to be coming home on a MAX 8. All right, Boeing now has a lot of work ahead. At this point, it's not really clear how long the planes will be grounded for. And that's it for tonight's newscast. Dan Burrett will be here at 11 o'clock. Have a good night. Good night.